Hume. I'm Cur Curtis Hewing. I'm in the uh, used to be Forest Health Protection at Cal Fire. Now we're Forest Entomology and Pathology Program. Um, we basically go all over the state. We work with a lot of the forestry industry. We work with um, homeowners and we collaborate with the U.S. Forest Service and UCANR and CDFA and and uh in the parks and everyone else. So when this popped up in the fall of 2019, late October of 2019, uh, we got looped right in. So um, the males and females are quite different. Your chances of ever seeing a male are pretty close to zero. There are these things here. They live in the deepest parts of the galleries right up next to the heartwood. Uh, it probably took me about a year to find them. Um, they're almost 30% uh, uh, smaller about two and a quarter millimeters. The females are pretty much always 3.1 millimeters. Um, I thought, oh, I'll go measure a few. I ended up measuring like 150. They were basically, every single one was 3.1. In Europe, where these things come from, they vary from 2.5 to 3.6, but for whatever reason, the ones that we got, they're all from one introduction, so they're all really closely related and they're all that size. So they were first found in 20, uh, 2017, but nobody bothered to introduce them. They got given to a pathologist and he just took the beetles and threw them in the garbage and got all obsessed with the fungus. And we'll get to the fungus later. But in 2019, Jake <laughs> raised the alarm again. And this time we got entomologists to go out and look at them. And we got excited about the beetles. So the main way to identify these guys is by these little bumps on the back. This is the uh, back of the wing cover. It's actually, this is the first stray that comes down here and then it takes a really big turn and goes around these bumps. And that's a character that you uh, absolutely cannot um, confuse it with anything else. And if you, I can actually see these now in the field just by looking down at them. If you have a hand lens, you can definitely see them. And there's nothing else really in California you can Use it with it once you learn what they look like. The closest one you'll find in oak trees is another introduced one, same genus, Xyloborus phyli. It's a little wider, it's shiny and black, and it's less even there. But if you really want to know what they are, send them to Mike or myself or someone at CDFA. So I've got two slides. Um, within oak trees, you'll find sometimes a lot of these guys, Xyloborinus saxisenii. Um, the natives are, there's two monarthrum, one of them smaller. That's the one you see most commonly, but you'll also see Pidiopthorus, Pseudopidiopthorus, and now Petrichus. And then there's really not much that's bigger. There's monarthrum scutellare. This one's four millimeters. And then on rare occasions, I just found a few about a week or so ago, you'll found platypus cylindris, but they're much bigger. They're six millimeters. And these are all to scale. So these ones are going to be more confusing because they're they're closer. And we have a specimen and a field scope so that if people want to take a look, they can get a sense for scale because three millimeters sounds like three millimeters. So you look at it, you're like, holy shit. Yeah. So um, they're not a native um, pest in their native um, range, which is technically they call populations of beetles, the same species over here, but they're not the same. So they're basically from the Pyrenees all the way over into Iran, up into this area here, they are actually the same. There was just a, last year, there was some DNA data that was published. And then they go into Southern um, Scandinavia and they're actually spreading North due to climate change. They're changing their behavior in Europe, they're spreading North and they're actually getting more aggressive. Um, but they're, they basically only attack trees when they're starting to dry out, which means they can only do one generation. By the time they're done with one generation, it's been two to three months and the tree's too dry. They almost never attack trees and kill them. They're basically there after they're dead. Um, they're, you know, they'll be standing dead. They might have some green leaves, but they're technically dead. Um, and then they're given the lowest pest rating and that includes impacts on cut wood. They're not even very aggressive on cut, but um, the primary 
<clears throat> the primary hosts worldwide is in the White Oak section. Um, here in California, it's primarily Valley Oak. It's less common, but they can, can be very aggressive on Blue Oak. And it took a number of years, took four years, three and a half years, but they finally got um, quant shown that they were attacking Oregon Oak in both Oregon and Napa. Um, in Europe, oaks are the most common, especially where these guys come from. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Mostly white oak section. And then there are these other two sections, which we don't have any natives, but they're very close to white oaks. And then when you get farther east out into the Baltics and Bulgaria and places like that, they start getting sort of secondary attacks on these. But I think that's because of what's called isolation by distance. Genetically, they're actually somewhat different. They're not as different as the ones in Portugal, but they're different. Okay, so when we first found them in 2019, we just found them in Calistoga, a little bit up the road that way, a little bit over here, maybe down here in the St. Helena. But over the last few years, and especially this year, the, um, um, it's actually probably this line should be further down because we found them in Cotati down here. Um, recently, they've been found all the way up into Cloverdale. We think they may be getting up into Hopland. They've been up in Middletown for a long time. And it looked like it looks like the main way they're being transported is in firework because they actually were spreading faster against the wind. The prevailing winds are this way through Napa. There's actually not a lot of activity south of the ground here, but they seem to be moving on firewood, mostly out into the rural areas, at least the quickest. Um, they're in Sacramento County. Oh yeah, I should go back. I didn't, I kind of skipped this. And then they were found in Citrus Heights this year. They're spreading south into this area. We suspect they're all through here, but this is where I've confirmed it so far. And again, it's almost certain that they were brought out here on firewood. So that's where they are, Citrus Heights, Fair Oaks. And they seem to be following um, the water through, like I've seen them here. I've seen a bunch of suspicious ones down here. They're all along these waterways. So that's what you expect, Valley Oaks are in waterways. But we've also seen with other pests like invasive shot hole more that um, trees, that are in river bottoms sometimes are more um, susceptible. We don't know if that's true for these guys, but it might be. Um, in 2018, one specimen was found in Troutdale, which is right there in Oregon. Um, they didn't think too much about it. We looked at it, we tried to sequence it. All we got was a bunch of amoeba DNA, so we weren't really sure yet. The assumption was that they came from here and went up to Portland. <laughs> Um, then they found another one. Incidentally, they weren't trapping for the Mediterranean oak borer. They found one more in Woodburn. And then I coordinated with the Department of Ag in Oregon to do an expanded monitoring program in 2022. They found 21 specimens, mostly up and down the Route 5 corridor, but also moving around in Portland. And they're, they also um, confirmed Oregon white oak as a host about the same week that I found it. In that county. Hey, Curtis, real quick, sorry to interrupt. If you are pointing to an image, not all of our online people have cameras. So if you can at least just like describe what you're talking about on the slide so they can get oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so um, online you can go into um, a database where they People sequence the same little fragment of about 650 base pairs of DNA. They upload it. It's got a geo tag on it, so you know exactly where the specimens came from. And so these are the ones from Portugal and probably that Western African part down here in the bottom of the tree where it's kind of orange colored. And then we've got the California ones. It's a perfect 100% match to these ones, these orange, lighter orange ones in the middle from France. Napa, California, Citrus Heights, and Belgium. And then the ones from Oregon are the, are the green ones up there. They're 100% match for all these in the green. And the, then the ones up at the top are actually quite diverse, but there's only one base pair difference. The, the difference between the California and the Oregon is two base pairs, but 
It's a very, very slow evolving um, gene, so it actually means they're genetically quite different. Um, and that shows that they come in from two separate introductions. They did not come from Oregon and move to California because it's so much nicer down here, or move, come into California and move to Oregon because they couldn't afford it here. <laughs> um, and then I went and I mapped out all these locations. A lot of them are very close together. So this is actually all of the data that wasn't from Oregon or California. And then because they have lat longs, I put that into um, Google Earth. And then I said wineries. And except for these two that are basically in Paris, everyone's within a couple miles or a mile of a winery. So what's going on here is these guys are moving within Europe in the wine industry, and they're moving over here with the wine industry. So the life history, uh, we'll start with the end of the year. This would be like in the fall, you got your tree. It's full of females. They're all full of eggs. They mated with those males that were living deep in the galleries. In the spring, they come out, they find a new tree. They're carrying a fungus in their jaws. That's actually what they eat. So I'll get into that a little bit later, but they have to bring this fungus. They're not eating the wood. They're just chewing it up and pushing it out of the tree. They lay eggs, larvae, pupae, adults, six to eight weeks. Females mate with the flightless male, and then the whole thing. Yeah, I'll talk a little bit more. This is sort of an idealized idea of what's going on. So in, in the native range, like I said, they're basically just attacking almost dead trees. Um, this guy in 19, probably 62 or 63, this Shadle, 1964, dissected 50 galleries. He only found one with multiple generations. Um, and that would only add a second, very small one. And then pretty much everywhere else, either have one or two peaks in March, April. So those are the ones that matured in the fall. They came out, they attacked trees. And then after they're done in that tree, because that tree dried out quickly. So by June, July, that tree is no longer any good. So then they fly out again. And then in August, September, they're getting ready to make another generation to overwinter. That's what they normally do in Europe. Here though, um, they're able to get into healthy trees up in the top of the trees. The reason they attack at the top, uh, I believe is that that's where the trees are under the most water stress. I also believe that we're seeing pulses of activity. So in 2019, there were a lot of trees dying, a lot of limbs falling. Um, so somewhere three or four years before that, during the height of the drought, probably in 2016, 2015, there were a lot of attacks. And then after that, 2020, 21, 2022, it was really hard to find limbs falling on the ground. Trees were dying, but not as fast. But this year, because We've had the intense drought 2020, 2021. We're starting to see a big pulse of mortality again. And I dissected three trees. Normally when these guys attack a tree, they go in, if the tree's healthy, they'll go in a millimeter or two, barely a body length, and they'll back out and go away. They got into these branches and they went one, two, three feet, just kept going. And a lot of them didn't reproduce. It was a dead end gallery, but some of them had little tiny, like this is a uh, reproductive structure. This is where they live, where they're laying their eggs and the larvae are feeding over here on the right with all these black squiggly lines. You'd find a little area at the end of these really long probing galleries they're called. They'd just be a little tiny thing. So they weren't very successful. They probably didn't produce more than just a few dozens of offspring in that first year. It's not until they get into the second and third years that they really start going for it. So um, they start at the top. This tree almost certainly was infested here up in the upper right where you can see a dead branch. And then they just keep going down. If they get to a Y in the tree, they carry this fungus with them, which is what they um, eat. I'll talk about it more later, but it's what's known as a wilt fungus, plugs up the uh, sapwood the uh, active xylem, and that means that if they get to a V in the tree, the water is not going to be going up very far, so they almost never go more than a foot or two back up a branch. They just keep going down, choking off the moisture till they get down to where that arrow is. 
That's where all the main branches come together and then they go around the entire bowl. And there have been cases where sometimes they fade slowly like this one and you can tell, but there are other cases where basically just one branch kind of comes down, the tree doesn't look so bad. And then people think, oh, it just died overnight. But the thing is that the beetles have been in there a long time. <clears throat> and if you see symptoms all the way down at the bottom, which I'm gonna go over in a little bit, the beetles have almost certainly been in there a long time. Not always, but 90% of the time or more. So the best evidence, this is a branch that fell in 2019, or what are, they're described as trellis-like galleries. They're often lined up in the same plane, which causes this fracturing and dropping of limbs. And they also link them up. These guys are semi-social. They're like bees. The males are unfertilized eggs, so they're what's known as haploid. You know, you have only have half the genes that a female has. Um, so you have... A, end up with a lot of females, all related, the males are related, and then they all cooperate here. And these are actually different, four, five, six different founding females, and they all get together. And that's also very unusual in these guys. And the literature, I've never found another species that does that. They usually avoid each other. And then the other thing you're gonna see a lot in oak trees are the natives. They're, um, there are two species, the one at the top, Dentigerum, that, that was the one that's smaller. So their galleries are gonna be a little bit smaller in di diameter. The Scutellari, that's the one that was four millimeters. Their, theirs are a little bit bigger in diameter, but they all have the same pattern to them. If it's a fracture straight across like this branch, they branch out like palmate, like a, like a chicken foot. Um, and these on the left side here, you can see a close up of a gallery where they laid eggs and they have these little side branches. They're not very long, maybe a millimeter long, two millimeters long, a little bit more sometimes. And the mob will never have anything that looks like that. That's always gonna be the mob. And they're all, I mean, it's almost always a dead wood or a tree that's really a death store. Um, when the tree on the left-hand side here, you can see a piece, a picture of bark with a bunch of dust. It's a little hard to see, but it's caught up in the moss and also spider webs. Um, that's a tree that's in a very late stage. And over here on the right, you can see all these entrance holes after you hack away. And you can see how they're all lined up. That's also quite diagnostic. On rare occasions, I've seen one picture where monarthrum was like this, but that was only in a live oak that it died of sudden oak death. And it will go crazy in a saw tree and it will look almost like this, but mob never attacks live oaks. So that shouldn't be confusing. So you can see the discoloration on the right. We have the heartwood. The beetles haven't gone in there, and you can see the traces in the uh, in the active xylem, and then the orangey brownness. That's the uh, wilt fungus growing through the wood and choking the tree off. And on the left, you can see the fungus moving up and down. So we got the cross section here, and then we have on the left we have a split piece of wood showing it going up and down, and it goes faster up and down, presumably. So um, we're tracking trees. Michael and I, we've tagged a whole bunch of trees, 2020. These are all mostly along roads. Um, in St. Helena and Calistoga, we're tracking those. And then in Leaf Break 2021, we took advantage of the glass fire because there were some reports that they were more aggressive on burned or slightly burned trees. And so we set up four different areas, infested and uninfested forest, and burned and unburned in both cases. So within infested forest, we have burned and unburned plots. Within infested forest, we have unburned and burned plots. Um, and so we're tracking these every year. We want to do it for at least five. We'll just keep doing it until we can't do it anymore. Um, one of the reasons to do this, maybe we'll be able to find some resistant trees. And it's also, we're really not sure how it progresses. We're guessing that it's a pulsy kind of thing, and we're guessing it seems to take four to five years, but we don't know. So this is a way to get a handle and get actual numbers on that that we're confident in. Um, so here's the Calistoga 
um, water treatment plant. We have three main plots here. The takeaway here, um, basically we're assessing the, uh, the crowns. It's really messy, it's kind of subjective, but you can see that in this one, quite a few of the trees declined by a lot, and these very few declined at all. This is highly disturbed. There's berms for the ponds, and then there's a bike path through the middle, and then there's disturbance for the um, vineyard. So it seems like disturbance definitely makes the trees more susceptible. Um, a, one of our colleagues at UC Davis has been doing some um, pathogenicity tests. He's done them um, on valley oaks. He's going to move on to blue oak and Oregon oak next. Basically, there's two fungi. The Raphaelia montetii is the one that's best known from Europe. It's definitely a wilt fungus. Fusarium is really well-known. Pathogens, we don't really know what's going on with these. Um, it looks like they're at most very weak pathogens. So we suspect, based on his work, that Raphaelia and Fusarium and this movement here through these little twigs, these are only, what, about a half inch around, right? So it's only moved maybe an inch in three months. So it moves very slowly. And that's kind of good news. It means that there is some chance that pruning, if it's done soon enough, may be able to save them. I want to stress the may. Um, just to, there's another disease carried by another Xyloborus on the East Coast called Laurel Wilt. That um, fungus has a... Um, yeast stage, and within a month or two, it just completely goes through the entire tree. This does not have a yeast phase. It's just growing very slowly as little mycelial threads. Um, the other thing we've done is we wanted to know what was the best way to monitor them. These kind of traps um, from AlphaSense are, are the best. They're two times more effective, then these Lindgren funnels are easier to handle, they're less expensive. Um, you can catch quite a few beetles, up to about 200 was the most I got. In a, a, well, 200 in two weeks, 100 in one week. Um, and in this year, this was the first year, we had a big peak right at the end of May. That's mostly because um, it was really wet and cold in the middle of the month. They started at the beginning and they ended. They kept going to September. I've done trapping last year and the year before, and I've gotten beetles every month, including December, January. We've actually been, what was it, 2020 and 2021. There were days that were like 80 degrees in January and February, and they were just pouring out of stumps and logs and wood. So here, not only do you have multiple overlapping generations in the same tree, they'll stay in the same tree for three, four, five years and just keep reproducing, but they also disperse all year long. Um, we were, there were some reports in Europe where they trapped them at ground level and at 70 feet up in a tree. So we're thinking, well, maybe we could just apply something, either um, some some repellent or some contact insecticide to the base of the tree, and maybe you could save them. So we started with this uh, bourbonone repellent, and it, was, eh, it wasn't bad for the first month or so, but here we're at 29 days, this uh, first cross here, and it's already dropped by more than half. And by the time you get it two months out, it basically has no effect at all. So not good, we gave up on that one. And then I was wondering, do they actually fly only on the ground? Because we didn't know what happened between six feet and 70 feet. So I made these towers. I set a bunch of these up. This is the Calistoga water treatment plant right over here. No lures, far, far from the trees. So we're not getting them coming straight out of the trees. And the only place I caught them was up here. So that was more bad news. They're dispersing high. Um, so management options, number one is don't move oak firewood, don't move any firewood, but for these guys, don't move oak firewood. Um, you want to remove an infested tree as quick as possible. You can chip it up. Um, you can solarize either the wood you can't chip or solarize the wood three inches or even less if you can get it down to one inch. That's much better. You can burn them. We really are, we're looking for money to get curtain burners 
and figure out like maybe we can have a centralized disposal site. We're working on that. Um, if you just put in mob PC, so it's Mediterranean Oak Board Pest Complex, it'll be in the top two or three results. If you just put that in uh, in Google. And MOBPC.org. Yeah, but if you put MOBPC.org, it'll be the number one. Um, and people are trying chemical options. They've worked well, or reasonably well. If you catch the tree really early with invasive shot hole borer, in terms of mob, it has not been proven effective or ineffective. So it's the basic fungicide plus insecticide, which is needed. Um, yeah. Do you have any thoughts on burying wood? Yeah, um, I've, we've talked about it a lot. and No one wants to bury the wood because there's just too much. But that would work. If you have a place to bury it, yeah. especially if you got like a foot down. So I, do I, yeah, I got this question a lot. Like me too, but I talked to the pathologist. We're not worried about chips spreading fusarium and milks, but whole logs are still really good habitat for pathogenic fungi. And me burying the ground, that is a pathway for them to spread living roots. Okay. I would not bury whole logs that are infested with real fungi. Okay, especially if they're ne near other trees. And the one place we thought about it was when we pulled down the first two trees in Citrus Heights. We seriously considered it. Um, uh, the arborists just, they did have a spot and they kind of buried a little bit of it, but they didn't have enough room. To, they were two huge trees. They were like three and four feet in diameter. I think if we, if you aged it, right, we can talk about this more during discussion, but I think maybe if you let it season and let the insects kind of die or emerge and let the pathogen kind of fade out, then we can talk about that. But if you're putting green wood underground, I, I just, it, especially around those material, I think it's more risk. And so we're also looking for funding to do a study. A study was done in Southern California for invasive shot hole borer, and we're in discussions with people in the UC system to, and the Forest Service, Forest Service to get funding and people in the UC system to carry out the trials. Um, we have a website for reporting and we've got information. This here is the, um, so you, you can report them to UCA in our reporting tool. This county ag commissioner's office, they'll usually call one of us. Same with the advisors and any one of us on the CAL FIRE uh, forest entomology and pathology program. There's four of us statewide. And this is the um, pest alert that a whole bunch of us put together. And that's this is available as a PDF. Do you have any to hand out? I do not have any hard copies, but it is on the website and yeah. I will send it to you. I can send a follow-up email with these resources. And that's it. All right. I have a little bit to follow up with, but is there any pressing specific questions to the content, not going into discussion and talking about what y'all have done, but what Kurt has presented? Is there any questions on that? We covered a lot. You know, we, we don't know a ton, but we know enough to make it kind of, we have a sense of what's happening. Anybody questions, ecology, biology? Yeah. Uh, I'd just like, if you could, to expand a little bit, you mentioned, you know, pesticide applications were limited in their efficacy. Would you be able to expand on what has been tried? Oh, Obviously. Um, for these guys, we haven't personally done anything. Okay. I've talked to a bunch of arborists that are doing it. Okay. And I'm continuing to talk to them and... We'll see if it works. So I'm tracking some <laughs> trees here in Santa Rosa that have been treated, and you've treated some too. <laughs> we just haven't studied it, right? We can't. And I'm also, and they've also cut some down, and they're solarizing it. I'm tracking that, seeing how long it takes. I'm trying to figure out the best little trap to stick under the tarp, so we can tell when we get to the end point. Um, and we're making some good progress there. Not, oftentimes, it's not necessarily the, the products themselves. It's getting the products to the target. Right. And when you get something that's it's aggressively boring into the entire past the meristematic tissue where most insecticides are active, right. uh, that just really shows that it's not necessarily that they're not effective. It's at a certain point. Right. The that, insects that's... are not coming to contact with where the products are, which means prophylactic is going to be a much greater effort um, 
depending on the value or the priority of the tree. Yeah, I think once the um, xylem starts getting significantly plugged up, then it's yeah. not. That's why I was stressing that early yeah. is really important. And the right time of year when they're moving the most water is also tends to be pretty important. Have you seen it in any ornamentals? Or is it just not yet? I, we had a call on a maple, but that was negative. Um, it's, and there was one other tree, but I think that was a false positive too. Likes cork oak in Europe. Yeah, likes mm -hmm. cork oak, but those are mostly the Portuguese ones. There's some reports in France. So that's the one that has 17% difference in its DNA. It's not the same species. But I mean, it's in urban forests, it's a big deal, right? It's yeah, really... it's in the right group. And I've been monitoring a few cork oaks in Napa. They, a bunch of wineries have been like out in front of their tasting rooms. You can go, oh, look, this is where corks come from. There's a ton of them along Condi Lane, right all along like front of tax supply. There's just like a whole hydro of cork oaks across from the valley that are all dying right now. The cork oaks are dying. The cork oaks are dying too, but I can't find mob on them. They just like, because they're planted in, you know, in a, like a swale. And right, and they weren't watered or. Yeah. yeah. We did um, put a log on a sawmill from a mob infested tree that had been treated, and the new wood that the tree put on did not have the same discoloration, um, same discoloration in it that the older xylem tissue had. So the tree put new wood on. It had what two years? Two years after after treat or three years after treatment began, we ended up taking the tree out because the winery didn't want it anymore. I was kind of curious about it. We slapped it on the sawmill and, and opened it up. And the, the discoloration wasn't there. I didn't stick it under a microscope. I, I can't say for sure. But right. Well, if it's a valley oak, it's pretty much up. Blue oak can be really subtle. Yeah, but it know, was it was pretty oak. obvious that it was bright white. And it seemed, seemed pretty healthy. Yeah. Um, you know, the other side of the tree had big, long columns of decay in it from yeah. where the fungus had been digesting it. But um, yeah. and, and we, we don't know which one goes faster, right? That's another thing we're going to be working on starting this fall and hopefully much more next year, is we don't know as it's moving down the tree, what's leading the charge. Is the fungus just plugging it up enough so that the beetles jump ahead of the fungus and keep reintroducing fungus down the tree? Or are they following the fungus and only attacking where the fungus is like the laurel world does? So that's something we're trying to get into. Yes. Earlier in your talk, I heard you talk about some of the geographic data about where the trees were and there was correspondence with access to water. Is there any data about predisposition or is it simply too early to tell? Yeah, we don't know. I mean, it, it's kind of contradictory because they should be um, more resistant if they have more water. But for, during an intense drought, those trees that live in those kind of cushy places tend to have wimpier roots. So I feel like maybe they're just getting hit harder by the drought. And I've seen that in a lot of different, I've seen it in conifers, I've seen it in willows and other hardwoods. So that's my idea. We have no real data to verify that, but that would be my guess. And then the other thing they found with the ishab is that the trees that grew really fast in these um, river bottoms had less resistance because they had, for whatever reason, they just um, had a lot less maybe cellulose and other things in there and they had big fat rings and they just were more susceptible for the invasive shot hole board. It may be that it's something similar to that. It's more density? More yeah, size. less density and somehow less resistance. Yes. Um, I have two questions. So yeah. one question would be, uh, what are you seeing for hybrids? I see a lot of hybrids in my work, the floating red oak and the shrub oaks, and also blue oaks and valley oaks. Have you been studying that? And my other question would be, um, have you asked anybody in Europe, what are they doing to shoot? They don't do they don't anything. Do anything. Like I said, for them, I spent like um, about two hours talking to a guy from Zagreb who does a lot of the work on them there. And he was 100% just interested in damage to the wood because once you get one hole into the wood, the EU rules are super strict and it all of a sudden it just becomes like <laughs> pallet wood. So, but even there, it was like fifth tier, which was the lowest tier. They just weren't that aggressive. So there's one page, one little tiny thing that came out. It was in a... Um, in, in a conference proceedings from Poland where they did report that during the drought over the last three or four years, they are seeing these attacking healthy trees now in Europe. So. Judge, I'll say, Torin Airman said that the other day in Napa Valley and we saw a Jalan, a uh, blue oak, blue oak, valley oak, and it was heavily Yeah, I've seen that and I'm tracking some 
Oregon blues up in um, Okinawa Valley State Park. I had to go back and reassess. We had some bad ideas. I had to go with a huge pole and clip leaves because you know all the lower branches were burned up during the glass fire and the burnt plot. So okay, those transitions are hard, man. It goes like Valley and then like white oak melange of incestual little mating and yeah. To out so I I'm curious about that. that's what I'm seeing. But I, I I collected the leaves. I brought them back. And the two um, Oregon oaks I found, I'm um, pretty sure they weren't hybrids. There were others around it that were hybrids. And I just said, okay, they're hybrids. I'm not too worried about those. They're mostly blue oak, I figured. But... This blue valley was hammered. Hammered. Right up the dude's house, too. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I've seen some blue oaks like, that got really hammered. That's what I've seen a whole valley a lot over. Yeah. Integration here. The sharp blue and blue painting road, which will you see that it's changing. You have both valley and blue and yeah, at least four, four, four species of the white that are hazardizing with each other. What's the so fourth one? Oregon, blue, 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 white. Blue. And you also have a uh, brother of flora, which actually looks pretty good. I mean, you're being, I haven't seen which one we need to That's a so that's that's not right. native. No, no it's shrub. Oh, scrub oak. Okay, so that's not a white oak, though. It, it is. It's, yeah, yeah. If you go on that road, you'll see a lot of them put together. So how big do they get in diameter? They're shrub. They're shrub oaks. About twenty feet. It's all I've seen. Because most ambrosia beetles won't attack anything under eight inches. It's very rare, and they kind of their attractiveness goes up, up, up until they hit about eighteen, and then it gets kind of flattens out. So there's sort of like probably around twelve inches. Is anything under twelve is really rare. I'd be surprised to see it. They're scrubby. They're small stems. They're and the only places I've seen a lot of um, blue oak mortality is when there's a lot of valley oak around them. I've seen a few attacks here and there yeah, okay. that weren't, and they seem to kind of die out. But again, I mean, it's early in the uh, research, so it could be we'll find an area where it's all blue oak and they're all getting killed. It's possible. Are you seeing this pattern? I think I've seen it. what I've been observing of you right there. Hottest side, the two thirty to five o'clock side. If there's a stand of valley oaks, that last one gets hit first, and the blow moves from west to east across the stand. It seems to attack the the most sun exposed part of the tree first. Oh yeah, yeah, because that's going to be the most water stressed, for sure. So is it somehow related to the 116 feet heat wave we had last summer? Yeah, well, um, we've been doing a lot of water stress measurements with something we never did before but we were having a lot of calls where people were saying like everything in the forest is dying because there's a disease that's killing everything it's raining down from all these 20 different species of trees and it's killing everything we're like no no it's water stress and they're dying and they're not even dead they're just going deciduous in late august when they normally never lose their leaves or whatever but people wouldn't believe us so we bought pressure chambers to measure. And so we've been doing a few little studies. And what we found is that the drought has a big impact, but the heat waves are what really do it. So in 2021, we were doing measurements of uh, mostly manzanitas, but also um, live oak and black oak and blue oak up on um, Mount Diablo. And so I don't want to get into the numbers, but the trees were kind of stressed, pretty stressed but we were getting massive heat waves and whole hillsides of Manzanita were turning brown. And so, okay, that looks bad. So then we went back the next year and we looked at the hillside and we couldn't even barely see any flagging. Everything was green, it looked beautiful. Did the water stress measurements, they were twice as stressed in 2022. When, after we had the heat wave in September, we went back out, they were a little more stressed, maybe another 10 or 20%, and we were getting flagging all over. So it's like, they're there, they're really sucking hard to get what water they can, but as long as they don't get the uh, heat waves, they can kind of keep up and keep from the embolisms, you know, and the gaps forming and the xylem. But you get those super hot heat waves day after day, and then it falls, you get a ton of embolisms and they turn brown and die. So if the plants have a huge deep well and plenty of water, you know, if they are watering the two feet of the fiber peroxide out of the end, the root line compost of the orchard. Yeah, that's water. another thing in our proposal is to see, because I've I've saved a bunch of blue trees up in the blue oaks up in the valley at the Nature Conservancy. We did an experiment two years ago. Didn't take much at all. We gave them using a you know just <laughs> um 
he didn't even have to go all the way around the biggest trees at the drip line with emitters, gave them 300 gallons for two nights, first week in August, and that was it. The ones that we did that to, even though their stress level went up, the weird thing was that when you measured the stress, the water stress level, it was identical everywhere around the water trees, even though it went up pretty high within where the literature would say they should be starting to die and start losing branches, but they didn't. The ones we didn't water, they were really uneven. The trees were starting to you know, do resource allocation. They were starting to shut off different parts of them. They were like 30% worse on this part, 40% worse on that part. And those are the trees. Some of them died. Some of them lost half their limbs. So it doesn't take much watering, but that was blue oak, which is much more resistant. So we want to repeat it next year with um, valley oak. But I want to emphasize though that 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 reduction in stress is temporary, right? It's only for the immediate after effect of the watering. Once you have another heat wave, another event, they're going to. Well, it was hot. I mean, every time I went and yeah. did, it was 110 degrees every time I went yeah. and did it. So that was enough. It soaked down in there, and it the waters. You know, but, but that's my point. You can't just do it once in the summer and expect it to protect the trees for the rest of the year. It's time. To... And it depends on when it rains. So right. we made it in that year. It poured like crazy at that site in the second week in October. And we were about ready to water it again because we thought they were probably going to need it real soon. But it rained like three inches or something. All right. One more question from the room. Anybody have anything else? Because I want to see if there's any questions that we can. I mean, there's a lot. Yeah. On this one. Yeah. Uh, tips on identifying the frass. So um, it's going to be light colored almost all the time, not a hundred percent. Every now and then, it'll have a lot of the bark mixed in. We had that problem. I had that problem just a few weeks ago. It's going to be very light. Um, it's very fine. I unfortunately I've forgotten how many. It's like two hundred by twenty micrometers. It's a bit, and they're really consistent because. The mandibles, they just go through there and nip, nip, nip. They're almost all the exact same size. Um, but again, that boring dust, it's, by the time you're seeing the boring dust, 95% of the time or more, the trees are dead. It's, it's, it's been infested for years up above. But, and then you'll get the flat-headed borers going in. And so you'll often get a mix. So you'll get both the flat-headed borers, which is a coarser, they colored kind of reddish and lightish color, but even black color mixed in with it. So it, it can be pretty tricky. Corey, I know you have at least like 15 questions that you still aren't answered. Is there any that we can get relevant to the conversation so we can move on and get to the open discussion? Yeah, um, someone would like to know the process of solarization since we talked about that a little bit. We'll talk about that later. Okay. Um, and then here's another one. I just lost it. Oh. What is the smallest diameter branch they will infect? And is sanitation pruning of dying branches useful? Um, it looks like when they attack, they'll go into branches somewhere in the seven inches range is about the smallest. But in Middletown, I found a branch where from the initial attack, they kept going out until it was only about two, three inches. But that's unusual. So I would say mostly around seven inches, give or take an inch is the minimum size. And sanitation pruning, yes. We'll talk about that later too. Okay. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of like, how do I ID? How do I, what do we do? And I think that's coming later. Yeah, so unfortunately, at those. the beginning, we thought we had really good and accurate vegetation symptoms, but unfortunately, lots of things cause those same symptoms. Yeah. So um, one of the things it does is it causes stunting in the leaves. So instead of a big full branch, you'll get little puff balls or popcorn balls of um, like little popcorn, pom -pom. little pom-poms of vegetation, but other things will do it. And there are subtle differences that I can now tell them the difference, but they're really subtle. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, this will be available. The ID, you know, the um, tools for ID are on the website. It's hard. We've shifted to just having to collect adults to make common confirm. Yeah. So And looking for drop branches and with those trellis like, <clears throat> Galleries is the best, it's because that's very specific. There's anything, no other species that does that. Yeah. Anything else, Tori, that's uh, relevant to this conversation? Uh, not at this time. I think everything will be answered maybe in your next talk, okay. and then I'll bring them up if they're not. I just have a really short slide talk because I know as tree care professionals and arborists, you are looking at forest health and oak health issues all the time. 
A lot of our online audience are master gardeners who are learning how to help their clientele. So what this slide will be, this project, the presentation I'll do is, I get calls and questions about oak health issues that they say, is this mob, right? The article came out and then every single time a leaf off a tree, they're like, mom's in my tree. Like, how do we not? So what I'm gonna go through is some common symptoms that I've been getting that people are associated with mob that are other forest health issues that are not necessarily better, but are different. And then really key in on the differences in the symptoms, the signs and symptoms. And then from there, I plan to be quick. From there, we'll go into the open discussion and really talk about what people have been trying for management, what they're seeing out in the field. I saw a comment from online that somebody said that it's in Marin. They need to go follow up on that if it is true. Um, so yeah, we need to kind of, you guys are basically our eyes and ears in the field and you need to help us kind of uh, really establish and understand what's happening uh, so that we can kind of accurately collect those data and then start to, to study this best. Other issues, and these are, like I said, these are things that I get questions about and that I see in the field that people get confused about, right? We're trying to really differentiate what we know how to ID mob and from other more complex issues. So the first one is just general dieback and decline. If we talked about the upper canopy always being the place where we typically see infestations originate. Well, frankly, a lot of the street, the urban forests and street trees are pretty stressed as it is, and they all have some kind of decline issues. And so when we see these kinds of symptoms, it's not necessarily mob, even though people want to attribute to that. It could be mob, but most of the time it's heavy stress, water stress, it's decayed, it's old, it breaks down. You look at the galleries and you see that it's monochrome, it's native ambrosia beetles. So it's a typical kind of process of decay and breakdown in the upper canopy. It could be other types of cankers or insects that damage. So I get a lot of these going, I have mob. And you're like, it's just an old tree, it's dying, it's senescent. Uh, then we have branch dive back. So the Plodius, this is where we get flagging of whole branches, right? And so we get, it's the same idea as like a wilt, but it's a canker. It gets into the tissue or branch, kills the whole branch. You get really large patches of tissue um, and foliage flagging back, dying back. Um, I'm sure you have all seen this. Uh, it's typically, you know, you can print it out. It's an aesthetic issue, but it won't necessarily kill the tree, right? It's not the sign of progression. It's kind of more limited to environmental conditions. Yeah. Um, I'm getting that you need to enunciate better. Okay. Well, good luck because I have a lot of talk about. Um, <laughs> so that's these are our branches, right? So we get big clumps of foliage dying back in the tree. Typically, the tree does not die, right? You see die back, the tree persists. Then we have twig blight. I've seen a lot of this this year. Who's seen a lot of this? We see this like every year. Um, it's kind of washed out, but basically, it's like the little clumps of foliage at the tips of twigs and branches and individual clusters of leaves that die out. This is another um, tanker that gets in the twig. It's cryptocline, it has this host list, it's kind of really broad, a lot of species. But you see it in the new growth, that's the big stressor here is it, it occurs in the new growth. So a lot of these pathogens that are native uh, really do well in warm wet springs, right? Because they're airborne and they spread through water sometimes. And so like when we have a spring like we did last year, a lot of the native and diseases are super active, and so we see a lot of these symptoms. So here again, it looks pretty, it's a pretty dramatic, right? There's a little death, there's little brown spots for that, the entire canopy. Um, but again, it's aesthetics, right? The tree itself is not necessarily going to die. It's just more of something that will persist through as long as we have precipitation or maybe some, uh, some help for that tree. Western of bark beetle. Um, Curtis, we had a slide on Curtis's presentation, Pseudopithecopterus, they're very cute, they're very small. They vector a pathogen called uh, foamy bark canker. It's a geosmithia, so it's the same as like thousand cankers in the walnuts. But the point is, is that during the drought, this is a specialist in drought stress. It's a native insect, specialist in drought stress trees. And not this year, but in the previous several years following the big drought cycles, I was picking up pockets of oak mortality, right? It looked like sun of death. It looked like other types of big die-off events that were kind of typical bark beetle outbreaks that you see in conifers. And always I found uh, western oak bark beetle in there, or I found trees where they had done their little exploratory kind of um, gallery and then backed out, but they inoculated with the pathogen. The pathogen, I wish I didn't include it, but you know, there's like a thousand little you know black dots with the pathogen infested. So when you see, you know, this is like the whole canopy dying out at once, right? As opposed to seeing little bits of the canopy fading in time. So this is very much kind of related to drought stress. But a lot of concern because it was hitting, um, you know, it's a lot of oaks and particularly the same oaks that we see some depth in. So I saw a lot of concern about this and then the move to moth. 
Anybody seen lots of lava? I mean, the galleries are pretty unique. They're really small. They're very like kind of distinctive from other monophorum, but it's been fairly active uh, kind of throughout the urban and natural forests in the last few years. Not so much. Storm damage, this is self-explanatory, but I don't know. most people don't notice their trees until they're all completely dead or they fall in their house. But we had a lot of storm damage in the areas. It's not ubiquitous or widespread, but there's certainly high elevation in some areas where we see a lot of broken branches that are starkly brown to the rest of the canopy. And so that's just a broken branch that's kind of hung up and people are like, is this moth? Like, no, your tree got hurt. Um, development and construction. So these trees are in Windsor, they're near infestation that we know is, is there, but when I got out and looked at them, I couldn't find much signs of insect damage, but sure enough, this is a remodel and they did a new driveway, a new pad. You can see all the cut roots, right? So we see drought stress root damage, probably our malaria in there as well. Our malaria, who knows? Everybody's seen our malaria, right? Everybody should raise their hand because it is everywhere and it kills trees all the time. Um, our malaria is pretty active too. I guess, I, I don't have any canopy pictures, but typically when you see a tree fall over and it has got no root ball, it's kind of stripped down to nothing. Um, that's a very classic sign of root rot. Seen a lot of that after the wet springs too, following drought. So there's already necrosis of fine root hairs during drought stress. And then you add in that a wet, that follow it up with a wet year wet warm year and the pathogen just kind of takes off the less of that the rest of that structural integrity and then we get these storms and these wind events and it just takes trees out. Son of death. Uh, everybody knows about son of death. Probably everybody's dealt with it. Um it's a water mold, it's doing well. It we haven't seen a lot of landscape skill mortality in son of death in the last few years because it's been so dry. But again with this um this nice warm wet spring uh, in two years, you all are going to get a bunch of calls about new side kill trees, right? It takes a couple of years for the pathogen to build up in the tree, and typically at least two years, we'll see a big pulse of mortality. Tan oak for sure, but we're moving more inland, and the concentrations are building up enough that we're starting to see it in the true oaks, right? It, it has a hundred species that it, uh, native species that it, can, that it can infest most of the time. It causes a blight, a foliar blight, but in, in tan oak, black oak, coast live oak, canning live oak, in Shreveso, it's lethal, right? So you're going to see the black oaks kind of probably have some mortality in these areas where sod is heavily established, like Sonoma County, Marin, and uh, Western New Mexico County. <laughs> Symptoms are, are very different, though. I mean, we see can't be fading, but we usually see necrotic tissue, lesions, leaf die back. So it's kind of very different in symptoms. Uh, it infects oaks through the bark. So we see most of the damage in the bark of the oaks. and the tan oaks, we see it in the foliage as well. Acorn pests, this one, not, you know, um, not so much canopy flagging or dieback, but a lot of drippy messes under trees. Uh, the scales have been, or the aphids have been particularly active this year, so lots of honeydew and um, uh, sooty mold and the white flies are out and the, the, the irregular galling mite insects are out too. But with the rain, we had, um, we're having a mass event kind of randomly throughout the forest across many species. Um, who's seen lots of massing oaks this year? Yeah, it's kind of really cool to see like across the the, the red and the whites and your intermediates, everything is kind of sporadically uh, uh, massing out, producing lots of acorns. But with lots of acorns comes lots of pests. And so what people are seeing is this all this sticky sap under their tree and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And it's <clears throat> called uh, drippy nut disease, acorn <clears throat> nut lane. It's just a great, there's so many great names that you can call it. But basically they get a fungal or a bacterial infection and they, they, they drip sap and they turn brown. But then we also are going to have filbworm and filbred weevil activity is going to go crazy. Um, I've been sampling for them right now and the, the weevils are out. They are super cute. I wish I had something to show you guys. They're really cool. <laughs> All right, um, and then gold spot report. So this is not here yet, but I want y'all, everybody knows about this. I need mean, everybody to know about this because this is in Southern California, but just like mob and sod and EAB, which is in here and every other serious forest pest we have, it's moving in firewood. So the host range, kind of the range expansion map show that this is also the habitat for it. It loves coast live oak, it loves California black oak and cane live oak, the same group as uh, sudden of death, right? So here's here's my like doomsday vision is sod is moving in from from the west and inland. G-sod is moving up from the south and there's going to be a nexus for the overlap and it's going to be 
It can be pretty bad because where sod can't get because it's not wet enough, GSOC loves hot, dry conditions, right? So they're not going to overlap. They're going to exist in different spaces attacking trees. Um, but keep an eye out for this one, right? Because the, the symptoms are unique enough that we should be able to pick it up. It shows up. If you start seeing D-shaped exit holes in otherwise healthy trees, we know we have a problem. Canopy decline, galleries, woodpeckering, all the good stuff. Shot hole bores, anybody know about those? They're in SoCal as well. They're, I don't want to call them cousins, but they're basically cousins or maybe. Um, they used to be in the same <laughs> genus. Okay, but so they're very closely related to mob. And um, I don't know. I Frankly, they're, it's pretty scary because they have over 100 species. They love every single, somebody asked a question about if we're seeing it in ornamentals. Well, guess what? If we don't, that's fine because the Kirishawa and invasive shuffle board love every single ornamental tree there is. And they're going to just hammer these urban forests. So um, that's another thing to keep an eye out. They're moving on firewood. And again, they can show up here at any time. Very similar symptoms. They do cool things like avocado. They call it volcanoing. It's like sap pushing out. Uh, gallery, notice they're slightly different. They're a little bit different than mob. Other things, oakworms, so defoliators, twig gurglers, things causing more flagging and dieback. Uh, uh, forest tank caterpillar has been doing pretty well this year. Uh, I've seen a lot in the madrones. The madrones are really hard with uh, western tank caterpillar. Forest tank caterpillar the last couple of years. Oak pick scales, all things that cause flagging that are aesthetic issues, not necessarily cause mortality, but people see and get concerned because now they think it's mob, but things that we should be paying attention to. So, right, we went over a lot of stuff. So let's just hone back in on what we're specifically looking for with mob. We start with the canopy, typically a branch. You, some, you're talking about the south side or the southwest side of stand can, it's a pretty common for us health problem. They're always the hottest and driest, most stressed part of the system. Um, kind of the same thing on the tree. I don't know how persistent you're still seeing that pattern, but for a long time we were like, why is the south side declining relative to the rest of the canopy? So there is some pattern. Maybe we're seeing the more water stress side of the tree more uh, vulnerable to infestation. So, so in those plots, we're actually keeping track of where the branches yeah. are. I haven't analyzed that. Yeah, but so there's probably a, you know, you're going to see at least one branch fading relative to the rest of the canopy. And then as the infestation progresses, either it moves down from the stem or the populations build up and they keep spreading and spreading. And then you have more and more significant mortality. So the whole canopy is essentially dead. By that point, they move down to the main stem. That's when you're looking for your really fine flower-like boring dust on the main stem. Sometimes we're seeing staining associated with bacterial infections or other things that get in through the entry walls. During wet years. So that was kind of a big symptom in 2020. We put it in all the talks. I saw some crazy stuff this year where it was like foam was pouring out of them and they were screaming like crazy because it was a wet year. Foamy bark canker, the canker. It wasn't foamy bark No, but I'm saying else. all of those kind of yeah. entry point like. And it was coming point. out of the gallery entrance. It mm -hmm. was shooting out. Bacteria, why was like foamy, foamy? It was a lot of it. Yeah. Um. So right now we're at the main stem and as we sample the trees or branches, we talked about this, you're looking for these unique gallery patterns and this is going to be your key. And if you collect adults, that's perfect. We can idea it very much on the butt spines. He was too much of a professional to call it that, but they're basically butt spines. They're unique deep ambrosia species and they're very easy to identify. But the patterns of the galleries is a really big tell too in stations. Management, this is where um, we're gonna go from here, right? And so, like I said, we use the management that we're promoting, the, I, the best management practices, integrated pest management, all comes from recommendations we've developed around the invasive chapel and pure child chapel borders in Southern California. Similar site species, similar kind of ecology infestation dynamics. Where we're at is we're still monitoring. We talked about this. I don't know if you got this too much. We're promoting chemical or excuse me, mechanical practices like chipping to destroy the material. Ideally, because we're dealing with really large trees, we got to burning is very efficient. So figuring out how to do um, high volume efficient burning practices. So, so getting air current burners from Cal Fire, whatever solarizing when we can, which has its own limitations because of things like the, uh, you know, the insect, we, let's, well, I'll save that, but solarizing can be very tricky for large volume woods, very much a boutique treatment. The tight spots on your tarpon right there, for us, that's where they're exiting, they're coming out of the wood and directly right through the plastic and taking off the fly again. So they're merging through the plastic anywhere that's tight in the corner. Exactly. So part of it is how you construct the pile, 
what kind of plastic you use, uh, the uh, sun rot of the plastic, um, what color plastic are you using? Why would the bottom of the kind of opaque feel on top? Clear, only clear. They are photo, photo, what is it? Photo, 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 photo taxic. If there's little tears in the plastic, they hone into that and they will go right for that. So any thin spots in a black any, plastic, they'll chew through there. So, and if it's tight against the bowl and they're emerging, they're going to chew through it just because it's like a barrier that they're working on. Well, they may not be the ones that make the biggest holes, the round headed bores and flat headed bores and bigger things. They'll go right through it if it's touching, make big holes like quarter inch, half inch. So, holes. super heavy duty clear plastic. We're not. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, he may add on this, but essentially tarping or solarizing does not kill them inside the wood. Wood is incredibly uh, 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 insulated. insulated. Thank you. It's getting hard. It's getting late. Um, <laughs> but it triggers earlier. It triggers like a mass emergence sense. It warms it up enough. They finish development or they get excited. They come out. And what solarizing is really doing is trapping those adults as they emerge so that they then solarize. They kind of cook inside of the the uh, um, uh, the kind of like the greenhouse that you created, right? So you're not killing them in the tree, you're killing them as they emerge. So you have to maintain the integrity of the covering. What does mill mean in six millimeter? Because the six mil plastic we're buying is nothing like a six millimeter serving width. But you want even thicker than six. You want like nine. You want the thickest contractor plastic they make. And you probably want to double it up, especially out here where we get, yeah. And you need to seal the edges, right? You have to secure the edges with chips or with gravel or something, because they will, they will crawl out, right? These things are tiny and they're smart and they're going to get out if they can. Yeah, you got a question? Oh, uh, just our company did the uh, job for the rich people. That oh, you were Yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. Um, so I was there two days ago. The six mil plastic that we put on is gone, just completely Already. disintegrated. Um, you can't even lift it. And you no problem too, right? Yeah. 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 So we were going to switch to probably greenhouse clear. Uh, so where was that? Was that whole lane? That was Paul Road. Yeah. 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 So one of them got replaced, as you saw, with the yeah. clear tarp. Right. Yeah. And then the other one is really dissolving. Pretty yeah. Good. It's going to be in this environment. It's with as hot and dry as it is, tarping is going to be or solar is extremely difficult. So it was like it was the particular kind of plastic that it was, or yeah, what was going on there. And like you said, it should be clear that was opaque, sort of like a translucent white. Yeah, you want sunlight penetration through it completely so it doesn't. And the other thing I've been thinking is there's I mean when I crawl underneath there to set my traps and stuff, I get soaked. It'd be nice if we could vent it to get the moisture. I don't know how you do that. Because that would, because you, the other thing you're doing when you're tarping is you're drawing out the wood. Oh, all right. I have one more fun insect in the discussion. Uh, yeah, just wondering when you mentioned. Oh, sorry. I have two relevant questions. Um, first one is best treatment question mark chip on site and cover with clear plastic. And then second question is can large limbs be safely taken to a commercial chipping site, i.e., grab and grow? Chips do need, don't need to be solarized. The point, chipping is the treatment, right? We, like we said, down to one inch, but even three inches is probably fine because like, even if they're not physically getting like cut up by the hammer of the blades, think about being like a three millimeter insect and going through that ride. Like it's gotta be pretty traumatic. So we're still like damaging most of the insect population. So chipping itself is a treatment or even a tub grinder, which is really fun because then you're dodging giant missiles as they shoot out the top. Um, I would say, no to greenway sites because that's why we have most of the infestations that we have around here. They're all associated with a very large, not to be named, three letter utility company that was moving lots and lots of infested wood from the zone of the infestation to a greenway site in Windsor. Right? So moving green waste material is gonna is worse than firewood because it's high volumes, it sits, it's gotta be left on site, treated in place. There's it has we have to. Be smart about how you move. And if you are going to move it, I guess the caveat is if it's inside the known infestation, it's a central collecting yard, the material is getting processed right away, that's different. But it's going to sit outside. If you're Especially if it's it. small. Yeah. I mean, you're going to, you're just going to spread the infestation if you're moving this stuff to sites. Jason? Yeah, I was just wondering with, with pine beetles and what you were saying about drying out the material, they talk about debarking. 
Is that something that well, because those are bark beetles? Them? They live on the cambium, so that's a little different. Deeper. Deep barking is not going to help very much. I think bucking them up is going to help the drying process. Yeah. Deep barking will if help. You split but... them or anything like that to get the moisture out. It'll make a huge difference. The problem is that we're doing it's huge. Yeah. The, yes. the, the, biggest, the biggest producer of beetles is the biggest part of the tree, which is like six foot diameter rounds or whole yeah. like eighteen foot logs. And you're just like, what in God's name do I do this? I don't know. We should try a propane torch. <laughs> We've done that with bark beetles before, where you just flare off the surface, but they're so deep. No, they're down there, you know, three, four inches. Yeah, this is something I want to. We didn't talk about it, but we did that steam treatment. We did steam, yeah. Um, okay. Just to see how hot it needed to get, it needs to get pretty hot. Yeah. If you forget everything else, as Curtis suggested, this is what I need you guys to remember. I know you're good about it because your licenses depend on it, but. For everyone online who's not an ISA or an ASCA certified arborist, do not move infested material. That is 100% how all of these invasive. Don't leave it piled by the side of the road. You see people coming along and like actually <laughs> just hacking off the infested bits, and you go back the next day and it's all gone. Or putting it under other host trees, right? Yeah. Cutting down a dead tree and then storing it in the stand or right under the neighboring tree that's still healthy is horrible. Okay, moving on, soapbox. I want to make sure we have time to talk. This one I just had to throw up here because I did my graduate dissertation on this insect. It is an, this is emerald ash borer. Who's heard of that? Oh, how come you guys don't raise your hand for GSOP and shot hole borers and sod, but everybody knows about emerald ash borer? Well, good on you. It's in Oregon. It was the furthest west was Colorado. It didn't fly or hitch, it didn't fly or like walk here. It moved on firewood. We have Oregon ash all the way through here. We plant lots and lots of ash in our urban forests. It's Modesto ash and it's other kinds of Excelsior and crazy uh, invasive introduced species, but they're all hosts. Every single ash species that we have in, in North America, all 16 are, are host free emerald ash borer. It likes white French tree, which you don't have. That's a southern species. It likes olive. But the point is, when, when we have EAB show up here, and it will, it's going to be a it's going to be a doozy, right? So again, it's just like, it's actually very much like GSOP where you're looking for D-shaped exit and ash. And, but we need to pay attention because this is another big one coming that is going to be a big deal. Yeah, they're the same genus, almost identical, the same size, make the same size D-hole. They're cooler looking. Yeah, they're a little cool. I mean, I think. But okay, so that's my last one. So uh, here's our contact. You can, the question was, who we, if we have suspicious trees, who do we go to? Curtis alluded already, email me, email Curtis, email your master gardeners, they get it to us. The website has also reporting guideline, all that good stuff, right? Discussion, we have about 40 minutes to respect your time. Um, what are people thinking? Who's been dealing with mob trees? Can you start on mine? Do, did we, how many questions did we address or are there still lots of unanswered? I have 14 unanswered. Some of them I need to go back through because you might have hit some of them. But okay. um, the moose. Uh, what about the root graft transmission of the Thelia fungus underground from oak to oak? That one I missed on the last. I mean the root grafting of Thelia from like like oak wilt in 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 the Midwest. Yeah, it's not impossible because the tree will be long, dead long before it gets in the root. These attack, that's the thing we've been alluding to, but haven't really addressed is like, we don't know if these can kill in our systems healthy trees. It seems like most of our trees in our urban spaces are heavily stressed already. So this thing that's just coming in is opportunistic. So it may be that they're already too heavily inclined to be like a source of transmission to, to the roots. Are you seeing mostly trees that are like in an urban environment or near roads or near disturbed areas or is yes. it? Okay. Yeah. So usually there's some other servants that is already predisposed to weaken those trees its purposes. And also just valley oaks, which is where we see them the most. They're, you know, they're in the valley bottoms in that thick alluvial soils. So they tend to be, you know, in the middle of a vineyard or along a road. And they got to, I mean, we do really silly things to trees in urban spaces, things that are unfathomable, but you can imagine, you know, that's right. What else? Um, almost lots of big words. Um, it would seem that. We'll answer it later. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll go back to that. 
Um, someone asked <laughs> about what is the vineyard connection, but I think that's just oh, service. Um, so there's, we suspect there's three ways they can come in. So oh, yeah. often <laughs> the um, barrels come in as individual staves. So they could be in the barrel staves. And we did have somebody say, yeah, when we get the barrel staves and they have holes in them, couldn't be us because we just throw them in a pile out back. <laughs> and that was near the epicenter, so <laughs> that might be it. And then I was talking to someone else who buys barrels, and he says that he does get them from France on pallets that are, you know, junky wood with holes in it. So they could be coming in in oak pallets that are associated. And now the big thing, right, is you get the huge steel fermentation and aging things, and you put big blocks of, you know, derated oak in there. I think those could also be a really good source because those are going to be big chunks. So anywhere the oak comes in, but those are the three I'm aware of so far. If you guys know of other ways that oak can come in through the wine industry. Are, are the regulators doing anything? Uh, for, <laughs> we've had a very big discussion ever since I finished that DNA data in May of this year. I sent it immediately out to Oregon. They were like, jumped right on APHIS and said, we need to regulate this. And they were like, no. But starting in the last month and a half, two months, they are saying, yeah, I think we do. And so they're starting a working group up there. We're starting a working group down here. We're going to work together with the feds to try to screen for things coming from these wine producing areas. With that, that doesn't change, tr change trade agreements, right? We can have border rules in place, but it doesn't change how we trade, which is the biggest problem. Because there's no international agreements on, it's like it's a handshake gentleman's agreement on how you treat wood between international borders. And if you have some kind of dispute, it just disappears and there's no sanitation in, in, in dunnage or woody material. Yeah. Anything else, Tori? Um, someone's asking if we chip, can we move the wood around locally that way? Yes. Local movement's fine. When we're talking about moving mess infested material, we're talking about like 200 miles away, right? And within the zone of infestation, you're screwed already. So it doesn't really matter if you move put around. It's just about, don't pile it next to Yeah, just don't keep it next to high value trees and, and put it in places where you want your trees to stay alive. But yeah, you can move local. Um, and then Mimi, who is our master gardener coordinator, um, she's wondering how the master gardeners can help. Is it just by getting the word out about the reporting site? Is there other specific things that you all think master gardeners can help with? Maybe your master gardeners have already been like inundating me with too much uh, clientele contacts, right? All you guys have been receiving lots of samples from arborists and homeowners alike, and I've been processing all those. So master gardeners. Learning how to identify the insect and how to really differentiate it from other pests has been super helpful. And then steering it towards us has been great. So yeah. we can Let do people can... know that when it's really droughty and hot, doing some very minor overnight supplemental watering, supplemental so, watering at the drip line away from the bowl of yeah, the tree. Bowl. So, so Mimi, what what we'll do is we'll I know like there's almost like 100 master gardeners on right now, but we will do some targeted master gardener outreach to really do education and programs to help you guys interact with clients. So, yeah. i clarify something that you brought up and it, maybe I missed one part of it. So don't move the wood. Yeah. Solarize it, chip it if you can. Then you made a comment. If you're in an already affected zone, I say we're working in this region, Lano Road, somewhere where we're getting tons of trees dying. We just hauled a grab and grow and started in the area. So I wanted to maybe see if you could dissect a little bit when it's better to leave it, when it's not. Like, are we talking within a 30 mile region, a county it's, region? It's never good to leave it, right? That yeah. if you, if we had infinite, if I just give you guys like money left and right, I'd be like, so everybody guys buys an air current burner and a staff and freeze it. Everybody has uh, equipment to deal with large diameter material because leaving it is, it, everything's going to merge and infest trees. So it's not yeah. ideal. but if that the reality is you can't treat everything, you just can't. And so if you're gonna keep it, I would say my preference would be on site. Yeah, so on site solarized is the preference. On site solarized, unless you have a dump yard where you know it'll get thrown into a massive chipper or into a print burner that same day. And you know, Curtis has been detecting it. The other thing we haven't talked about is the flight period is periodicity. 
there's a pulse and emergence in the spring and they kind of emerge throughout the year. But the nice thing about that is that it gives us a window to kind of operate with them, right? We know that if we have heavily infested trees right now, there, there's gonna be adults emerging, but most of them are gonna be waiting to come out until that ideal spring condition. So that gives us a target treatment date. So that we can say, let's do a bunch of treatments now. Maybe that material builds up, it's not great, but as long as we treat it all and get to it before next spring, when they're gonna start emerging, we can minimize the, we can kind of flatten that curve, that population density. But I, ideally on site, stays on site, at, at least until it seasons. Yeah, but once you cut it up, if it's sitting out in the sun, they're gonna come up. Yeah. I got a quick question. Yeah. I'm still not 100% clear. If you chip the whole tree, what are you guys recommending? Well, what you do for iShob is even at one inch, they're only getting like 97% of them. And then they actually they compost them. Right? I mean, I know you said it up like 100 and whatever degrees it is, 140, 97% control to me is pretty solid for an yeah. insect. If you chip every single piece of that infested tree, you're done. That's it. We can haul the chips off and go down. I, I would be fairly confident in saying that yes, you yeah, but that's what we've been doing. So that's cool. All right. Yeah, but you don't want to take them. You still don't want to move them way outside the zone. Of yeah, you don't want to take them out of the zone of infestation. No, but we, you know, nobody wants a contractor to pile for, of wood, right? So if you just chip it all, then you they can use it for your compost, mulching, whatever. Yeah, I think mulching it back in this like. The idea of sanitation and printing out the infested trees is also improving the vigor and health of the remaining trees, your keep trees. And so choosing that material to mulch your remaining oaks, is, if you're adding supplemental watering, it's going to be really important to kind of making them more, well, hopefully more resistant or more tolerant of, of infestation. And we're running into it in vineyards. There's like no place to put anything. <laughs> no. and they're surrounded by valley oaks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, John. Three weeks ago, out in off the Stony Point, um, I got two mature valley oaks, both totally dead. The first one I come to, I identify Mob for sure. <clears throat> My customer's aging; he's on oxygen, but he really loves his trees and he watches them. He's sure one of them died a year ago. I go to take a sample that one. I sharpened my axe the night before with a disc grinder, really quickly, and my axe just bounced off like four times. The bark on the year old one valley oak was just hard and dead. And uh, I finally got into it and I didn't see any activity. And I contacted a mentor who's a local arboriculture teacher at the JC, I don't want to say his name. And he says, they may have moved on from that one. It's so dry. Oh, yeah. A year ago, they may have You'd only on. be looking for galleries at that point. You wouldn't be. You would be. You yeah, would the be. galleries would still be there, but the beetles are gone. They require very specific moisture content to successfully colonize that tree. So when they're dead and dry, the beetles have long left. So that's what I thought. So I don't tell that Unless much. it's yeah. the middle of the winter and so yeah. yeah. But we bring enough covering anyways. And my boss, step ahead of me, she says, check it anyways, the whole way to the foreman. Yeah. He gets up, we got to clean out there because there's an active beehive in one of them. We have to relocate the bees. And every cut on the year old one is emerging mob beetles as we're cutting nonstop and we're taking pictures of it. And this thing's at the base, it's so dry, I can't barely get my axe into it. So then we have to cover them both. How could it still be there when it's that dry? So what time of year was that? It was about three, two weeks ago. Is it Bob? Are you saying it died a year ago? Because that's. Yeah, we brought them back and put them under a microscope. Definitely Bob, at least. I haven't seen that. So I, I don't know because they would have had to have finished developing in June or July of this year in that tree. So the, for whatever reason, the moisture content must have been high enough for them to produce their ambrosia fungus, because otherwise they would have left. I've seen completely dead trees like in February and March that were totally full of Still beetles, close. but that those trees faded in the fall. Did you check the cambium of the whole tree? I didn't get all the way around it. I could. Okay, well that- but I mean, oaks are crazy. There can be an inch of living cambium and that will keep that thing- Yeah, that's all it takes. Alive for years. But there wasn't a leaf on it for a year. It doesn't matter. I mean, that could have dropped leaves and still be living tissue inside the tree. Yeah, absolutely. That's what happened. Okay. Anything else? Where can you find those traps? You might have said it, but I was outside. So. Alpha sense. Yeah. What's it called? Alpha sense, like smells. Alpha scent? Okay. Alpha sense. Okay. Um, you guys picked, uh, what was it? High release ethanol. So they're like sleeves. You can. Look online, there's other ways to make them. You can just get like a vial, a little bottle, 
put like a one sixteenth inch hole in the top. Yeah. And then you use uh, you just wet, that's that's enough. It'll wet, just come out through that little hole. <laughs> and wet cup them too. And do what? Wet cup them. Make sure you use propylene glycol. Oh yeah. yeah. I use propylene glycol, so you know the pet safe and it freeze. Uh, I was curious about uh, bird nesting season uh, as far as invasive species go. So, you know, you remove the tree, but there's not to nest in the tree. Is it always, are there any regulations about that? Is it always birds went roll? There's no regulations about mobs, so. Yeah. Depends on your local ordinance. Yeah. I mean, I have my own. <laughs> All the local rules, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Yeah, how deep into the wood do these critters go? They go as far as the sapwood goes, so up to like six or eight inches. That'd be the extreme. A lot of these larger trees we've cut, it's been as thin as just two or three inches. But it depends. They they just they'll go all the way through the limbs that are up to about eight or twelve inches. But then once you get down where it's really hard, dry hardwood, then they don't go into the limbs. We've been here for almost a decade. That's um, yeah, a little more. That's based on just when we found them in 2019. There were trees that had been totally infested. They were bucked up, left on the side of the road. They've been rotting on the side of the road for three or four or five years. So we know it goes back to at least 2010. Um, now, the sort of kind of to the ecosystem, have you been noticing anything that is? Um, preying on them, I guess would be like What's it, sorry? bio control preying on them. Oh, well, no, control. unfortunately, biocontrol never works on bark or ambrosia beetles. Uh, their biology is such that, I mean, people have tried all kinds of crazy things like, we'll take the beetles out and we'll put a pathogenic fungus on them <laughs> and get them to crawl back into the tree. So they try that. And that's either to kill their fungus that they're eating or to kill them. That doesn't work. And because they're internal, you, the only things that work are like, if the tree is completely un, um, infested, contact um, pesticides have worked to keep them out. And then once they're in, the only way is to inside out, basically. Basically, all of the population control for these guys, I didn't really want to get into it, is what's called top, uh, bottom up. So it's all tree resistant. There's all kinds of things in there. There's... Um, Huge larvae of um, checkered beetles. I've found um, cream flies, you know, the big things. You, oh my God, it's a mosquito, it's that big. Most of them live like in soil or along streams and stuff. There are species that live in the galleries. Mm -hmm. I've found them a bunch of times, but they don't really do much. In their whole life, they eat like one or two larvae. <laughs> and there are not that many of them. So, oh, so it's good for those predators. They have a good life, but they don't, they're so, it's such a bounty. Too deep. Yeah. Right. So yeah. that's what happens is the trees. So the, the gold spotted oak borer is a classic example. It's not considered an invasive species because it came from southeastern Arizona. Within the country, it can't be an invasive species. But those spe those oak trees, they're really hard to find. They got brought just across basically one state border, and we have completely different oak trees with no resistance, and they're just going crazy. We gave it a dumb name. We call them in invasive endemics. Yeah, but if you want to get funding and regulation yeah. through the federal government, they are not invasive. They still care. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen any instances of uh, structural failure of yes. leaves with still green foliage? Oh, that's, yes. uh, that's no, maybe a little, dead. sometimes, but it's very rare. Very, yeah, very rare. But it is. It is very common that once they die and dry out, you step up because that trellising that like. Same same plane working they do creates basically like a saw and it structurally creates a plane of weakness. So we do see branch failures happening earlier than I would expect with like normal ambrosia beetle decay of, of dead dying. It will generally die back first. Yeah. Oh yeah, the branch will be dead and then the next year it'll fall. But on rare occasions, I've seen some where they somehow got in right at a weak point. And so they were only infesting one side and they were still kind of green and there were a few leaves up top and it fell. And they're good at what they do. So we're piecing these things out over houses where we can't get equipment. We think that we're going to be good on eight inch material, nothing smaller, because it's going to be brittle after that. 
You mean it's like it's dead, dead? Yeah, yeah. Most of the branches that fall are in that eight to ten inch range that I've seen falling. I mean, and they will go up in the beginning sometimes, and it'll be as small as six. And then as we're coming down, we're going to expect the wood to be have more integrity because the hardwood wasn't intact. Right, the hardwood wasn't intact. Yes. And, and so if you're doing sanitation pruning, you we don't know the pathogenicity or how far they're moving laterally through the tree through the through the straws. So you're cutting. You know, you may be going to a node you think is a good place to make that cut, but go to the next. Yeah, go as far as you can. As far as you can when you're sand printing out branches. And clean your tools with what? I don't. I'm not. We've research has shown that spreading pathogens with chainsaws and stuff is really difficult. So it depends on the pathogen. Well, the ones that we're dealing with for the most part. So uh, it's just clean cuts. Make sure your tools are in shape. Sure. We all burned out. Can be. I mean, this is great. This, this conversation. Does anybody have any research they want to talk about? What? Yeah. Question. Actually, not a research question, but we're talking about preventive insecticides. What chemicals have been shown to be effective? We are putting on what we've been putting on for sudden oak death. I'm not a chemical guy, so you're gonna have to treat me with kid gloves. You don't have any. Nothing that's been what? shown. Is there I mean, there's basically one cocktail that's uh, certified with a new. But there, it's pro, it's the, it's a propazole, which is a new Arborjet fungicide with a benzoate, right? That's what people are using. That is not that is not a promotion for the use of that chemical. We have no idea efficacy, no idea. But but prevent. So we just. But that's just, what the, they said for iShot. So that's all we know. But I want to be very clear. Like, I'm not recommending you to do that yet. Yeah, but, but when you're saying there's a higher level of effectiveness when you do preventive insecticide treatments topically. Well, these are systemic insecticides are prophylactic. They never are a remedial a solution to an infested tree. They are always too. No, we're talking preventive. This so preventive. we're out advising our customers how to be preventive. We're but I can't guarantee it's preventive because the complexity of injecting insecticides depends on the, the physiology of the tree, the movement of water, how much damage already exists from other things. These are phytotoxic chemicals. If they just sit at the root crown where you inject them, they can cause splitting and wounding and do even more damage. Um, you get irregular translocation. You need translocation to the entire tree, which means you need a ton of water, which means you got to time it to the right time of year, which we don't know yet, but I'm assuming it's going to be right around spring, right before they're emerging and reinfesting trees when their trees are moving water. And we also now have no idea if the fungicide is effective against their ambrosia fungi. We have no idea if the chemical is effective against killing them. So I'm not at, at this point recommending chemical treatments as a viable option. We will research it, we will study it, and we will test it out, but I'm not gonna say that, I'm not gonna give you any confidence that they're efficacy. We're just confirming your collective opinion about this is preventative, cultural conditions, proper hydration, the edge of the decline, and potentially stabilizing soil moisture. It's bigger. It's improving the health and vigor of your trees. That's right. bottom line. Yeah, that would be the very, Chemicals Most are expensive, best environmental, best environmentally. Yeah. Chemicals are last in your IPM hierarchy. Chemicals are right now and probably in the future. For I've worked on a lot of invasive insects. He's worked on a lot of invasive insects. Chemicals are always like the lab go to. You've exhausted every other option to try to. And for these them. kind of beetles, they're never are even close to 100%. I think for the iShop, it's like 40 to 50. Yeah. Yeah. And so, no depth, that's a. Phosphonate, that's a prophylactic too. It's also highly irregular, it's phototoxic. It's the same idea. It's very inconsistent in their efficacy. So I know that you, chemicals are a hopeful option, right, for landowners, but I, and landowners are doing them anyway, but we're not recommending that at this time because we still know, we have no idea. Yeah, I mean, the couple people that I know that are doing it, I told them not to do it. We did. But they were like, well, you know, I really love this tree and I'm willing to just try it. So we can't stop. No, <laughs> their tree, they can do whatever they want, but I, um, I'd be worried about unintended consequences, yeah. Uh, someone wants to know about topical spray or injection. So we're talking about systemic injection chemicals. Topical sprays are not going to work. You have to treat every single surface area. If you want to go do that, you can go out with a spray gun and carbaryl. I've done it on G for GSOB. It's fun. I'm sure I'm immune to the insects and how much carbaryl I'm just yeah, But GSOB only attacks at the bottom. Right. So you have, to, you have to treat every single bark surface on a value of top, bottom, every side to make a topical insecticide effective because it's contact, right? So that topicals are not an option. 
somebody want to do soil drenches. I am also not a fan of soil drenches. It's something that maybe we'll test, but typically soil drenches are. You think about how complicated it is just directly injecting a chemical into a tree and how irregular and imprecise and taking its efficacy. Put it in the soil and then try to figure out how it's going to work. It's almost it's going to break down. And all yeah. Things. So any of these chemicals that could potentially be injected into the tree, is that going to have any toxicity for the acorns? That's good. That's another good question. We have no idea. Like usually these chemicals that move to all the tissues and they're the length of the toxicity acorns. Typically with they've done it with the massive antenna and it, it's very uh, uh, inconsistent and not a solid one way or the other. So but it's certainly an important thing to consider. We're injecting at a time of year where there's no H1 in the trees, though. Right, in the spring. Right. The spring. And sense. the insecticide isn't necessarily insect specific, right? These are general, like broad spectrum insecticides. So they're going to kill anything in the tree, good and bad. Because these, these trees have specific cultural significance. And... There are going to be times when, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's a, it's a big deal. How far out are we from some research on insecticides? How many decades do you want to give me? Yeah. Well, we already had meetings about getting funding, and we were supposed to have a meeting with the researchers this month, but everyone was on vacation. So next month. And so hopefully they'll start next year. How do we promote getting you guys funding for this? Uh, for a service we've already talked about. Yeah, we're service. we're tapping into our available resources. Uh, a congressional movement. Go get your constituents yeah, and your local. Yeah, well, yeah, someone already that. called up an assemblyman, and there's little. Thompson. What's that? Thompson. 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 There's little whispers, but if we get more, we get more assemblymen and yeah. senators get their years. The problem the with year. determining the efficacy of insecticides is you're also battling environmental variables that can improve. Like if we have a wet year, a dry year, and then a bunch of wet years, you're like the tree survived. You're like the chemicals work. Like no, it's because it got a lot of water. It's hard to separate out what is truly the effect of the chemical as opposed to environmental conditions and other types of physiological uh, events that are happening. So we need lots of time to really treat and monitor treated trees. Yeah. To, and the other thing I should say about this, this is a yearly, if we do recommend insecticides, this is every year. I doubt these are going to be very effective for a two-year cycle. This is going to be every year. Which means you're doing a hole, putting a septum every Three, five dbh inches around a tree every year for as long as it lives. <laughs> yeah. As opposed to your vision, the only clues as to why North America is attacking my wood here? Just because of the resistance. Not co evolved. And there's still not, like I was saying about those probing galleries, it's still not like the trees are 100% open for business. It seems like, and we're keeping our fingers crossed that this is true, that. It looks like they need to be pretty stressed even here. And we're like I said, there is that little uh, conference proceeding where they found in Poland the same thing, where these beetles that were never killing trees before, after the years of big heat waves and drought, they're starting to see a bit of trees. I'm concerned that as their numbers, their population explodes because of the beetles. They, they are able to attack healthier and healthier trees as they're- They don't seem to mass attack in the same way that bark beetles do. It's, it's kind of a different biology. It seems like Chris was suggesting that their population dynamics are more tied to the environment. So wet years, dry years, dry population. Because for a long time, it's so hot and dry, populations were persistent but not exploding. And then this year, it was so wet and we had such a two-year lag of drought conditions that the populations exploded. Now we're seeing massive mortality. But those trees, even if it had been a drought this year, those trees would have probably looked even worse. They probably went faster. They probably would have faded out faster. Yeah, probably would have faded out even faster. Mm -hmm. I've seen a few valley oaks um, that were completely defoliated, but uh, the buds all got like, lost. Yeah. But the whole tree never really ever flushed out. And I had mean, some like, mites in there too. It was just kind of like, twigs still had high so Like maybe you know, that, that might cause those. Did Epicormic sprout after that, or did, was it done? a little bit down low? Yeah, but it was even like all the. So what stripped it was it just the because it wouldn't be the oak. Um, 
Tomorrow, right? Because so like no, no, it was it was only seen them attacking one year when it was really weird winter when it didn't get yeah. cold. It was yeah, it was before like during emergency and like they came in and attacked so we couldn't even perform all stuff. We had two years ago we had a spring, or maybe I can't remember it was, exactly. I think it was last spring. Was where, it last year? Yeah, where they um there was a bud break basically like half the trees bud broke in like the beginning of February. And so there, the caterpillars were on the live oaks in the area, and they came over and ate half the leaves on the valley oaks. And then the other half the leaves came out a month later. Then a month after that, the rest of the leaves and, that had been eaten then came back and out. They finally looked normal. In the same period, right? We had and that yeah, was in, kind of yeah. But then we had freeze. We had a late freeze, so they were the black oaks and the valley oaks were leafing out. They got ten caterpillar or leaf roller. We had freeze. It killed the buds and the caterpillars, and then they had another flush. Right. We actually had three flushes in some of our procedures a couple years ago because they got hit with freeze, insect defoliation, and then drought stress. Can we talk more about mob and Gary Oak? Well, we don't know like, very much at all. The two that I've seen were two. burned by the glass fire. The ones in Oregon were not burned. They were in, you know, like a park situation. So we don't know much. And that's where, um, in terms of testing, their susceptibility to the beetles and the fungus. That's okay. the other, like, big thing we want to test. Online question. So I've gotten this one a couple times. Is there any hope that taking off the top infected branches could save the rest of the valley oak tree, have removed too mature trees, and more failing? Yeah, sanitation pruning is if you can detect it early enough, sanitation pruning is going to be really important. Yeah, it might. Again, we haven't proven that it'll work, but it might. Um, and the further down you can prune into healthy wood that appears healthy, the better. Well, we don't know, you know, early stages of the fungus being in there. We don't know what it looks like yet. Yeah. And then the second one, this is back on the uh, insecticide stuff. Do you can limit the number of point infections with systematic insecticides and slow spread of infection with sy systematic. systemic fungicides? Shouldn't, in theory, we expect the tree's life to be extended? Assuming that we address the source of stress, irrigation, whatever else we need. That's to do. assuming that the, the the cocktail is working, and that's what we have to test, and that's what takes time. Right? Because you can improve the bigger the tree as well as treat it and think, oh, the chemicals did it, but really it's because you gave it water and you sanitized, pruned it, and cleaned up, and it's not the tree. So, in theory, the idea of chemicals is that they boost the immune system to trees, but we have no idea really being able to tell you if that's. Sure, right now. I just want to thank both of you. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you're here, right? We did this two years ago. We got like 100 arborists to pay attention. It was driven by PG&E, who was really concerned about it, and it, it petered out after that. And so now we've got some really good engagement, and I hope this conversation continues. Those who, like Jake and the crew and Napa, who have been dealing with it, great partners. I would hope, like Merlin, and you guys have been working really closely. Curtis, I hope the rest of you keep in touch with us. You have my contact information. I have a digital card if you want it, but uh, we, we need to hear from you. You're the ones that tell us where the issues are. All these, all these practices for sanitation or for disposal are making us take longer and cost more than the hundreds of brand new tree companies in Sonoma County that aren't doing anything. And the only way I imagine this floor being equal there is if there was some enforcement of where there was going I did contact that ago. I only got to two people there about whether they could expedite tub dining for us. And they said, don't bring it in. But I've already noticed an outbreak going down Todd Road, every direction from Garden Road. So people are bringing it there nonstop. Like when, when can we expect there to be some enforcement or at least some? I, I don't think it will be. CDFA was involved early and we kind of, that's Peter Dow. Cal Fire can do a zone of infestation, but all that does is quarantine material that we're moving from outside of known infested counties to new counties. Within an infested county, it does not limit the spread. We don't have very good tools for managing invasive insects. So that, I was, I mean, that's why we're hoping if we can get a big bunch of funding to do it from the other end, have a disposal site that makes it low cost. So this, you have more than one, have one here, have one in Napa. The same way we want to leverage the, the constituents to push their their uh, representatives to, to, to pay attention, we want to go to Cal Fire too and say, 
within LNU and the local units, you guys have at least 11 aircraft burners that are just sitting there. Yeah. Two of them are active in Lake County because, well, frankly, every tree in Lake County is dead right now. Um, yeah, so Cal Fire too. Uh, well, we're, gonna, we're talking about uh, chemicals and sprays and stuff like, have you ever tried like uh, radio frequencies? I mean, getting getting into the trees with a uh, radio frequency because, you know, there's frequencies in trees that will change the behavior on insects. So I don't know if this will help on, on this. And it will go through layers. You don't have to tunnel any tree. You don't have to, I mean, I don't know if you, this is a, a another way to get to the yeah, they're just so tight at. Yeah, oh, somebody contacted me and I read the papers. They didn't get very far yet. It was somebody in Santa Cruz that was. Yeah, and that they like like Ken Rafa and, and their research group out of Arizona did a lot of work on bark beetles and sound waves. Um, it's 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 an interesting hypothesis. It has some really difficult to detect. Effect, right? Really difficult to test, and the the research that has been done is not showing evidence. They, we are doing acoustic study. You can, they are, you can hear them like a really heavily infested, not these particular insects, but like a heavily infested conifer. If you listen, you can hear them chewing, yeah. right? And they click and they stridulate and they talk to each other in the tree. They chirp and stuff. But um, these guys go. These guys, they're all pheromones. Just, they're all driven by chemical communities. Do they communicate at all? No, they're caramel driven. They're just attracted to the yeah, chemicals exactly. from the tree. And the tree. So the alcohol is coming off the. Stressed out tree. Anybody else notice how those, what those trees smell like when you take them apart? Yeah. So they're not producing any aggregation pheromone. They are not talking to each other because I was kind of hoping we could hear them. Yeah, that's true. And this whole like tribe doesn't talk to each other. Yeah. It's hundreds of species they tested like many of them. They don't stridulate. Really boring. But you can hear them when they bite. <laughs> when they bite the wood, you can hear that. I've seen these blisters. I've only seen this twice. I don't really know it's new. Why do got these four to eight inch blisters that I'm drawn to because they've got the new black bleeding on them, but they're actually bark blisters off the wood. When I hack into them, bad smelling yellow stuff that looks like antifreeze pours out. Under them, we did find the dark tunnels that look like the mob were. Was that this year? Yeah. Yeah, that was similar to what I saw in Fair Oaks. Huh. So I don't know what was going on there, but I think it was a bacteria. It sounds like alcohol flux or wetwood. Yeah. It's associated with the board. With the board. Well, it's probably there already. And then just because it was so wet, um, it was able to kind of blossom in their galleries. And it pretty much killed the uh, beetles, <laughs> as far as I could tell. Yeah. I mean, they were in there, but they weren't looking good. There were a couple kind of moving yeah. around. But it was a beautiful, huge tree like this big in someone's yard. I didn't want to hack all day. I just took a few chunks out of it. So I asked them to contact me with, if they take it down. So we'll see. And then I can hopefully kind of run around and inspect the wood after they cut it down. Anything else? Yeah, and I've never seen that particular symptom till this year. And I think it's associated with all the rain. Yeah. <laughs> I can go up night. But, so I'm seeing a whole bunch of associates. One is a beetle that's 13 millimeters long. It's a beautiful, brilliant purple color. Every yep. time I see my that beetle's there with it doing something. With yeah, it. that's a. Okay. No, that's a. Um, oh, Try to sit in. Oh. Okay. And they're in, it, they're in all these things. They're in pine trees, they're in oak trees. They're predators. Okay. Um, and then so I've got a sample from that tree. Been riding in my car and drive for two weeks. I finally put it under a microscope, and there's just like it's a it's teeny with tiny translucent little beetles that some of them are only a quarter millimeter in size. It seems as if mites. it's mites. Sorry, um, mites. Oh, sounds like mites. Yeah, don't uh, don't touch that one. They're in house all the directions. So it's like <laughs> this you can see all from the after the like, right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, those are predators, and then there's like there's always another level of insect. Yeah, and then the mites are probably just eating the decaying stuff that's laying around. And then there'll be mites eating those mites. <laughs> and then the parasite of that. Yeah, tree. yeah and you'll see um, all kinds of parasitic wasps running around. This place is a dead tree. Mm -hmm. yeah.
Is there any sort of biological control that wouldn't be more problematic? Like, like I was saying, people have been looking for biological control for bark and ambrosia beetles for 130 years, and no one's ever found anything that was efficacious because they're just their lifestyle that they're not exposed. Biological control works great on like aphids, things living on the surface of a leaf or on a stem. But once it's all the way inside there, plus these guys have all these fungi that can outcompete if you try to throw some like pathogenic fungus at them. Their fungus is going to kill that fungus. And they've also got bacteria in there that protect them. Yeah. They're good at what they do. They're really good at what they do. Uh, yeah. You said uh, you chipped under an inch in diameter. That's a good treatment you can do. So that has been researched in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, On a lot of ambrosia beetles and other in insects. Yeah. yeah. And traditionally, two or three inch was what they did. The invasive shot hole bore is so tiny, like 1.8 millimeters, that they had no effect at three. <laughs> at one yeah. inch, they were able to kill most of them. Yeah. So there is a big improvement between three and one, and that'll apply to any beetle. But it'll three inches is better than nothing. If that's the equipment you have, can go to three inches, do that. If you can have equipment that can go to one, that's much better. I know it's more expensive, it takes longer, but the fine the material you can produce. The more sanitation we can get. Sure. It's I one 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 or three is, is like a hundred eighty degree difference, right? Like maintenance, wear and tear takes so much effort to like process through that. Yeah. And we understand the cost thing. So if you can do three, just do three. Yeah. That's why I put three up on the slide. Because that's been considered kind of the standard for most ambrosia beetles. It's just when they tried it with the invasive shot hole bore. It was totally ineffective. They had to go smaller. So when they're tub grinding, they use the finest screen in the tub grinder and they use the finest chippers. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> two ambrosia beetles do well at for colder climates. I mean, just thinking about well, there does seem to be an elevational yeah. limit of about two or three thousand feet for these guys, even in Europe, and they don't seem to like cold weather. So their historical records, you know, a couple hundred miles up into Scandinavia, but they're spotty. And those were like 100 years ago or more. And then they didn't find them at all. And it's only in the last five or 10 years or so, 20 years that they're starting to move back in. But they're still very southern Scandinavia. So, yeah, these guys don't like it really. Well. But other insects? Some of them have no problem at all being frozen. Being frozen. Yeah. I was thinking about like um, just the distribution of the of uh, the Oregon White Oak from British Columbia all the way down to Southern California, how that just that transition would change. I mean, mm -hmm. with the, the elevation and stuff like that. So, well, you know, I mean, even so this, far yeah. we've been in mixed forests of blue oak mm -hmm. and Oregon oak, and we've seen blue oaks getting attacked at least low levels, yeah, exactly. patchy, like in the campground or, you know, here, there, everywhere, and all, basically almost none in the Oregon oak. So it, Anecdotally, we haven't proven it. It seems like the hierarchy is valley oak, blue oak, Oregon oak, but we're going to continue to look into that.